as Palm Sunday is it marks the beginning of what we refer to as uh, as Passion Week or as Holy Week. Passion in that context uh, is not from the English word passion, meaning desire, but rather the Latin word uh, and actually the Greek word pasco means, means I suffer. And so it actually refers to the we- this, uh, this time of suffering of Jesus, the passion of Jesus. And so the Palm Sunday is the Sunday prior to Jesus' death and resurrection. And named Palm Sunday, uh, not because he gave high fives on the way into to Jerusalem, uh, but rather uh, because of how the crowd received him as he came into the city with palm leaves. I don't know if you've noticed, we have a few palm leaves here on the stage. Just a few. Thank you, Danielle and Tina, uh, for that. But, um, but Palm Sunday, it, it, it marks the beginning of this, of this week, of the Holy Week. And that um, we'll, we'll take a deeper look into Jesus' entry into Jerusalem here in a moment uh, and talk about, uh, talk about how he is received and, uh, and how the palm leaves play a role. Um, but this morning, um, we are, we're going to be looking at the two drastically different ways that Jesus is received in just a short period of time. Uh, we see Jesus received by some crowds as hailed as the, the promised Davidic messianic king, the fulfillment of scripture. And, and hailed and worshipped as king and celebrated. Uh, and and co- that contrasted by Jesus being seen and received as being a blasphemous criminal that needs to be stopped at all costs. And so we see these drastically different perspectives and receptions of Jesus. And the, ultimately the question is, uh, that it's going to lead us to is what is what is our response and how how do we receive Jesus? And so that's what we're going to be looking at this morning uh, in our Palm Sunday message. If you remember last Sunday, we looked at and, and talked about this, about Jesus setting his eyes resolutely toward Jerusalem, knowing what was there waiting for him knowing full well that the cross was there waiting for him, but he resolutely set his face to head to Jerusalem in, to, in fulfillment of the Old Testament and in order to, to lay down his life for us. So as we talked about last week, Luke records over you know, 10 chapters from 9 to 19, this, this journey that Jesus takes towards Jerusalem And then finally, Palm Sunday is when Jesus arrives. And prior to, just as Jesus comes to the city, he sends two of his disciples in and tells them to find a donkey and tells them exactly where to find him. Tells them exactly what to say when they're asked about their need for this this donkey, for this animal. And so Jesus, again, as we've talked about, displays that he knows what what he could not possibly know. He knows exactly where this animal will be. He knows exactly what to have them say, and they won't have any conflict. Jesus knows exactly what's going to transpire, again, powerfully showing us that the cross is not the failure of Jesus. He's not caught off guard. He knows exactly what's awaiting him. And yet he not only walks into it, he ensures that it happens. So Jesus sends them into the city to to, uh, acquire this donkey and to bring it to him. And then we pick up in verse, um, and and Matthew will then tell us exactly, uh, tell us why Jesus chooses this unlikely creature of a donkey for his grand entrance into the city. Matthew 21, verse 4. Matthew 
says, This took place to fulfill what was spoken through the prophet. And then Matthew quotes from the prophet Zechariah, which Rana just read from at the opening of our service, Zechariah 9, 9. And rather than, than, than reading Matthew's brief summary of, of this passage in Zechariah, I wanted to actually look at it directly. So Zechariah 9, 9, where the prophet Zechariah says, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout in triumph, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you. He is just and endowed with salvation, humble and mounted on a donkey, even on a colt, the foal of a donkey. And so Matthew, who remember is one of the 12 disciples, he's a firsthand eyewitness of Jesus' death and of Jesus' resurrection. And that Matthew actually uses this phrase 10 times in his gospel that things are transpiring exactly as they are with regard to Jesus in, in order to fulfill what the Old Testament had prophesied regarding the Messiah. And so this is actually the ninth of 10 times in Matthew's gospel that he uses this language to actually uh, to explicitly tell the readers that Jesus is, is fulfilling scripture, that his choice of this unlikely creature, this lowly donkey, it is to fulfill scripture. And also, there's something else to this as well, that, that he chooses this lowly, this lowly animal that's not what you would expect or even what you would necessarily want for your king to come riding in on. You would expect or maybe want him to be on a war horse or to, to come in and, you know, riding a lion or, or something that would be impressive and, you know, demand that awe. But Jesus chooses this lowly donkey, which represents and illustrates that he comes gentle, humble, as a servant, to, not just to wash feet, but to lay down his life. And even the creature that he rides in on into Jerusalem illustrates that powerfully. Continuing on, after the, the disciples bring him the donkey, picking up in verse 6, the disciples went and did just as Jesus had instructed them and brought the donkey and the colt and laid their coats on them. And Jesus sat on their coats. Most of the crowd spread their coats on the road. And others were cutting branches from leaves, uh, branches from the trees and spreading them in the road. And the crowds were going on ahead of him. And those who followed were shouting, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. So Jesus rides in on this donkey. And, they, and the crowds give him this royal reception. And, and, and there are some elements that may seem funny to us. Why are they they're laying their coats down? Uh, first on the donkey and he, that he sits on. And then they lay their coats down on the path before him. And what we see when we look at, when we look at the culture and the context, that there, it's, there's an, an Old Testament um, passage in 2 Kings, in chapter 9, when the, when the Israelites receive and celebrate King Jehu, and they put their, their coats under him. And so there's, the, their coats are, are used in, in connection with the celebration and reception of King Jehu as king and here as King Jesus. And likewise with the palm branches, we see that in, the, in two intertestamental uh, documents in First and Second Maccabees, which are not scripture, not inspired, but they still can be helpful for us to understand pieces of the culture 
at the time. And there are two different places, one in First and one in Second Maccabees, where we see palm leaves being used in worship. And so they, they receive King Jesus and celebrate him as the king laying down their coats. And they worship him and hail him as Hosanna. And they refer to him as the son of David. And this is, this, this is a powerful statement pointing to who Jesus is. That the son of David points to this messianic prophecy, this prophecy of the Messiah in 2 Samuel chapter 7, where, we, where God promises David that through one of his descendants, there will be a king who will take on the throne and reign without end for all eternity. And we see that, that Jesus is constantly referred to and refers to himself even as the son of David. This just becomes a, a powerful, a frequent title for Jesus. And so how is Jesus received by Jerusalem? Well, initially he's received by being hailed as king, and not just any king, but being worshipped as the long-awaited son of David, this Davidic messianic king. They praise him in, in word and lifting up their voice. They also praise him in action. And going before him and laying down their coats in the palm branches. But then, the, and, and then after that, then this, we, we read that the city is stirred with excitement around who Jesus is. And that these, these, this crowd goes back home and tells people of that Jesus, the promised king, has come and that he has arrived and is there in Jerusalem. So there's this great excitement stirring. But then the next question is, we say, but wait a minute, if that happened on Sunday, what happened for such a drastic difference in response to Jesus on Thursday evening when he's arrested and then he's, he's accused and tried and, and crucified on Friday? Of that same week and that's and what we see is that there are these two drastically diametrically opposed responses to who Jesus is either reception as the king of kings and thus is to be worshiped or that he is a blasphemous liar or lunatic that needs to be stopped So in great contrast to how he's received on Palm Sunday, we see on Friday afternoon in the courtyard of, of Pilate that Pilate is, they, they're, the, the crowd with the Jewish leaders, they're yelling and screaming accusations and, and, and imploring Pilate to crucify him. And Pilate tries to get, you know, to get to the, get down to uh, uncover what's really going on and what crimes is he really guilty of and does he, is he deserving of, 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 of death and crucifixion. And Pilate, you can tell, is frustrated because he can't find anything wrong with Jesus. He can't find any crimes that he has committed worthy of such, uh, of such a, a condemnation, of such a... Um, uh, of death and crucifixion. And so what Pilate does is he actually tries to, uh, he tries to find ways to release Jesus, to exonerate him and to release him. He even offers up Barabbas, this notorious criminal, and says, well, I'll, you know, according to their custom, I'll, I'll release him or Jesus, thinking, of course, well, Barabbas is much worse, that they're going to want to me to release Jesus. But no, they say they continue to continue to implore him to crucify Jesus. So then let's turn to Matthew 27, verse 22. When Pilate then says, well, then if, I, if I'm going to release Barabbas, then what shall I do with Jesus? 
who is called the Christ. And Pilate asks, and they answer, crucify him. And Pilate says, why? What crime has he committed? But the crowd shouted all the louder, crucify him, crucify him. And you can, you can just sense this, this, this frustration with Pilate. But the crowds are dead set on crucifying Jesus. There's no interest in, in evidence, in truth, or in ultimate justice. It's just re-reject him. Who he is, who he claims to be. We reject him and his authority and what he offers just want him to be stopped, to be crucified. And so Pilate is caught in this dilemma where he, he, he wants to be on the neutral ground of, you know, I, I, he, he wants to keep the peace with the crowds, but he also doesn't want to put an innocent man to death either. And so he's caught in a difficult place. But the crowd is not responding to reason. And so, in fear of his own safety, in fear of keeping his own office, he acquiesces and finally gives them over to the crowd. And so Pilate, in verse 24, saw that he was getting nowhere, but that instead an uproar was starting. And he took water and washed his hands in front of the crowd and said, I am innocent of this man's blood. It's your responsibility. And of course, this doesn't absolve Pilate from his role, from his responsibility that he takes in condemning and, and crucifying Jesus. But of course, Pilate tries to be in this neutral ground. He tries to... He tries to, 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 to pawn you know, the, the judgment on them for if, if, if he is truly innocent, which I believe he is, the blood's on your hands. And so he hands them over to be crucified. And this just highlights how, how sharp and how deep this rejection is of Jesus by the crowds. And in such a short time span, we see these two drastically different responses to Jesus. That some passionately shouted Hosanna and received him and welcomed him as the king and worshipped him as the Messiah, the Davidic king. While others vehemently shouted crucify him over and over. These two responses couldn't be more different from one another. There's one final scenario I want to look at where we see both of these responses together in the same scenario. And that is on the cross. You see, the, the crowds are mocking Jesus. The soldiers are casting lots for his clothes. The Jewish leaders and the soldiers are mocking him and spitting on him. He's being beaten and tortured and made fun of. If you're the, if you're the Savior, why can't you save yourself? And then one of Luke's gospel tells us there are two other criminals being crucified with Jesus, one on his left and one on his right. And one of these two criminals joins in on mocking Jesus. In verse 32 of chapter 23, Luke writes, Two other men, both criminals, were also led out with him to be executed. And when they came to the place called the skull, they were crucified with him, along with the criminals, one on his left and one on his right. And one of the criminals who hung there hurled insults at him saying, aren't you the Christ? Save yourself and us. Essentially, he's saying, you aren't who your coup you've claimed to be. If you are this great, powerful, 
Son of God, if you are this great Messiah and King promised of old, if you're the fulfillment of all of Scripture, save yourself. If you can't save yourself, how are you going to save anyone else? And so this, this man is essentially shouting on par with what the crowds were shouting, crucify him. He is a liar or he is crazy. But the other criminal on the other side of Jesus rebuked this man, saying, don't you fear God, since you are under the same sentence. We are, we are being punished justly, for we are getting what our deeds deserve, but this man has done nothing wrong. Then he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. To fully appreciate both, what both of these men on either side of Jesus are doing, I want to take a moment to, to point to what this, was, what, what, what this was like for them to be able to actually verbalize their rejection or acceptance of Jesus. That on a, the, a crucifixion victim would often die of suffocation. The way that they were positioned, they actually had to push up to breathe and to consider having your feet nailed and in and, and the immense pain that you're in and to have to push up with your feet just to breathe, gasping for breath. And for this man to go through such great lengths and pain and exhaustion just to shout out mockery of Jesus? This isn't just, oh, I don't know, or maybe, maybe not, or an agnostic, I'm not sure. But he is going to great lengths and pain to mock and shame Jesus. And consider how, just how deep and sharp this rejection is. And likewise, on the other side, that there's this other man who likewise is willing to go through so much discomfort and pain to push up, to chastise him and say, no, we are dying justly. We deserve what we're getting, but he does not. And to ask Jesus, please remember me, remember me. I am guilty, I'm getting what I deserve, but remember me in your kingdom. This is not just a, neither one of these men are taking a neutral stance. You have this sharp contrast. Their last breath and the little strength that they have to either mock and shame and reject him or to humbly, to humbly hail him as king and ask him to remember you in his kingdom. And Jesus responds to this second man saying, I tell you the truth, today you will be with me in paradise. But these two these two responses that we've seen in these two crowds and that we've seen in these two men hanging on the cross, crosses next to Jesus. These aren't just responses of, of, of contemporaries of Jesus in the first century. These also are the responses that we have available today to make to Jesus. They either, either we respond in acceptance and in worship and in obedience to Jesus. If he is who he truly who he claimed to be, if he is who scripture claims him to be, if he is who he validated that he is in his actions, the only response on our part, the only proper response is one of worship. 
is one of praise, of, of, of following him, of saying, Jesus, I can't, I can't deserve what you're offering me. But you, would you remember me in your kingdom? So we have that response or the response of rejection, of absolute rejection. Either we can shout Hosanna or we can shout crucify him. But there is, no, there is no middle ground. And Pilate, if you remember, Pilate tries to take that middle ground. He tries to be neutral, but there is there's no neutral. As, as C.S. Lewis, the, the, uh, the previous, he used to be an atheist, and yet came to, came to find in his, in his pursuit of the truth that, that the, the Christian message about Jesus is true and his life radically changed that he he were either Jesus is a liar making false claims about being the only way and the truth and the life no one comes to God the father except through me either he is a liar or he's crazy he's a lunatic or he is lord He's liar, lunatic, or Lord. And those are the two different responses to any one of those three that Jesus is. And the question is, what is our response? The Christian author and, and pastor uh, Francis Chan says, some will shout Hosanna, in their words, but in their life shout crucify him. We it's possible to in your words shout Hosanna, but then in our lives shout crucify him, because in our lives you can accept him verbally, but not accept his lordship over your life and say, Okay, Jesus, I want you to save me, but 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 this is my throne. Give me some space. How dare you tell me how to live my life or what to do? But if Jesus is who he claimed to be, if he is truly who scripture positions him as being, if he is truly who he validated his, uh, who he is in his actions of, of coming back from the grave, there is no other response other than, God, how, Lord, how do you want me to live my life in such a way that pleases you? that honors you, that reflects your goodness, that reflects your truth and your holiness. And the, these are the two responses. And, but this morning, regardless of where you're at, and maybe you say, I don't know who Jesus is. And maybe you're in pursuit of trying to understand or trying to come to a conclusion in that. What I want to challenge you with this morning is the question isn't, what have you shouted in your life or in your words coming up until this morning? The question is, what will your life and your words shout going forward? Because both of these men on either side of Jesus were getting what they deserved according to his own words. And both of them in their lives had shouted, crucify him. But one of them made the choice in his final breaths to accept and respond to King Jesus. And so this morning, I want to challenge you and to offer for you, if you don't know Jesus as the Lord of your life, as Lord of your life. Maybe you know who he is. Maybe you acknowledge who he is, but haven't actually let him sit on the throne of your life. This morning, I want to challenge you. I want to ask you. None of us knows how many breaths we have left and how much time we have to make that response. Would you respond in openness to Jesus the King shouting Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest. 
Would you bow with me as I pray? Lord, we come before you this morning. We're so thankful for who you are, for the great lengths that you went through for us, that you went through such pain to push up on that cross, to be able to verbalize the words that I, today you will be with me in paradise, that you paid the price for us, that you have loved us beyond what we can even understand or recognize. And Lord, regardless of where we've been or, or who we've been or what we've done up until this point, that you offer us your grace. Lord, would you move and work in us? And those of us sitting in this sanctuary this morning, and those of us watching the live stream or the recording on YouTube afterwards, Lord, wherever we're at, would you speak to us? Move in us. Would you open us up to what it means to accept you as Lord of our lives? Thank you, Lord, for your love, for your offer of salvation only in you. It's in your name that we pray. Amen.